Good evening. Hello. I'm Ruth Berggren, Director of the Center for Medical Humanities and Ethics. Welcome to the 18th annual Frank Bryant Jr. Memorial Distinguished Lecture. Health outcomes come from a wide variety of factors, including genetic predisposition, physical environment, social relationships, health system factors, and much more. In the United States and all over the world, these factors are intertwined with a lengthy history of unjust treatment and inequality for people of color. The events of the last year have brought the consequences of these inequities into particularly sharp focus. Our speaker tonight is internationally known for her work in health equity. We are thrilled, I am overjoyed, to welcome Dr. Lisa Cooper, and we'll in, we will introduce her in detail in a few moments. But first, I want to extend a warm welcome to all of our guests tonight, especially Mrs. Gloria Bryant and her family. We are so sorry not to be with you in person, but honoring Dr. Bryant's memory is a high point this year as it always is. Special thanks goes to the Bryant Lecture Planning Committee, which identifies distinguished speakers for this event each year. Many members of the Center for Medical Humanities and Ethics Advisory Council are here today. These community leaders do a great deal to support our programs in ethics, global health, community service learning, and the medical humanities. I have a few housekeeping details that we must go over. Our presenter and the planning committee have no relevant financial relationships with any commercial interests related to this activity. Those seeking continuing medical education for physicians can claim their credit before midnight using event call-in. As noted on the slide, you may call 210-888-8298 or use the app to enter event ID 109501. Instructions were emailed to you today. If you need assistance, please email us using the email address humanities at uthscsa.edu. Our speaker pre-recorded her Bryant Lecture presentation, and she is also here with us tonight live. For our Zoom attendees, please keep an eye on the chat during the lecture. Dr. Cooper will be there answering your questions and offering additional insights. After her 55-minute presentation concludes, Dr. Cooper will join us live for a 15-minute moderated question and answer session. Again, Zoom attendees drop your questions into the chat. Finally, a few words about Dr. Frank Bryant Jr. for whom this lecture is named. Dr. Bryant was a beloved family physician and community leader in San Antonio until his premature death in 1999. He was among the first African-American students to graduate from the University of Texas Medical Branch. He went on to become an important advocate for the medically underserved living on San Antonio's east side. He served as the first African-American president of the Bear County Medical Society and the first president of the C.A. Whittier Medical Society. He co-founded the Ella Austin Health Clinic and co-developed the East San Antonio Medical Center. And now I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Chiquita Collins to introduce our speaker. Dr. Collins is the Vice Dean for Inclusion and Diversity, as well as our Chief Diversity Officer for our Long School of Medicine. She joined us in 2017 from Johns Hopkins University, where our speaker has long been affiliated. And with that, I turn the microphone over to Dr. Collins. Thank you, Dr. Bergeron. Welcome and good evening, everyone. I have the distinct honor in introducing our annual Dr. Frank Bryant Jr. Memorial Lecture Speaker this year, Dr. Lisa Cooper, who's a dear friend and colleague. Dr. Cooper is a Bloomberg Distinguished Professor at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine and Bloomberg School of Public Health. She is also the James F. Fry's Professor of Medicine in the Division of General Internal Medicine and a core faculty member in the Welch Center for Prevention, Epidemiology, and Clinical Research and she holds a joint appointment in the School of Nursing. Dr. Cooper was born in Liberia, West Africa, where she witnessed the effects of social deprivation on the health of many of her fellow citizens and developed the passion for a career in medicine and public health. A general internist, 
social epidemiologist, and health services researcher, Dr. Cooper was one of the first scientists to document disparities in the quality of relationships between physicians and patients from socially at risk groups. She then designed innovative interventions targeting physicians' communication skills, patient self-management skills, and healthcare organizations' ability to address needs of populations experiencing health disparities. She is the author of over 180 publications and has been the principal investigator of more than 15 federal and private foundation grants. She has also been a devoted mentor to more than 60 individuals seeking careers in medicine, nursing, and public health. Currently, Dr. Cooper directs the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Equity, where she and her trans transdisciplinary team work with stakeholders from healthcare and the community to implement rigorous clinical trials, identifying interventions that alleviate racial and in income disparities and social determinants and health outcomes. The center also provides training to a new generation of health equity scholars and advocates for social change with policymakers. A compassionate physician, prolific researcher, and devoted mentor, Dr. Cooper has received several honors for her pioneering work. These include a prestigious 2007 MacArthur Fellowship, elected membership in the National Academy of Medicine, the American Society for Clinical Investigation, the Association of American Physicians, and Delta Omega Public Health Honor Society. She has been listed on Tom, Thompson Reuters' uh, top 1% most cited list for social sciences several times. Dr. Cooper has received the George Engel Award from the American Academy of Communication and Healthcare, the James D. Bruce Memorial Award for Distinguished Contributions to Preventive Medicine from the American College of Physicians, the Herbert Nickens Award from the AAMC, the American Association of Medical Colleges, for outstanding contributions to promoting social justice and medical education and healthcare equity, and the Helen Rodriguez Trias Social Justice Award from the American Public Health Association. With regard to mentoring, Dr. Cooper has received the David M. Levine Excellence in Mentoring Award from the Department of Medicine, the Sponsorship Award from the Women's Task Force of the Department of Medicine, the Vice Dean's Award for the Advancement of Women in Science, the Provost Inaugural Award for Excellence in Faculty Mentoring, and the Provost Inaugural Award for Excellence in Diversity. Dr. Cooper has also been recognized by several community organizations, including the American Heart Association, Associated Black Charities, Mon Monumental City Medical Society, and the Maryland Mental Health Association for her community engagement and advocacy to address health disparities. She has been on major media speaking on COVID-19 impact on communities of color fairly recently. And without further ado, Dr. Cooper's presentation entitled, Why Are Health Disparities Everyone's Problems? Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for inviting me to give the Bryant Lecture at the University of Texas, San Antonio. This evening, I'll be talking with you about the topic of my new book, Why Are Health Disparities Everyone's Problem? I'll start out by talking with you about my transatlantic journey to a career in health equity research, share with you some lessons learned from the creation of the Center for Health Equity, which I now direct, talk with you a little bit about how the pandemic of COVID-19 has impacted vulnerable communities, and then conclude with some recommendations for advancement of health equity through practice of research and community engagement. So here are the lecture objectives. First, we'll talk about some key definitions and frameworks for health disparities research and practice, talk a little bit about some of the gaps in evidence and highlight some of the research methods used in intervention studies. And as I mentioned before, talking about the impact of COVID 19 on uh, health disparities, as well as recommendations for advancing health equity. So let's start out with where my journey began. Many of us know that our opportunities and um, experiences shape who we are. And in my case, this all began uh, with my journey in Sub-Saharan Africa, which is where I was born. I was born in the country called Liberia, a small country on the west coast of Africa. And I'm descended from a West African 
tribe called the Golas. They are rural farmers, as well as I'm descended from freed blacks and free slaves who returned to Africa from the Americas in the early 1800s in search of freedom and a better life. Now, the photo you see of the couple uh, at the bottom in the middle of the slide is of my parents. Um, this is Isetta Roberts Cooper and Dr. Henry Nehemiah Cooper. My father was a surgeon and my mother worked as a librarian at the University of Liberia. And together they established the Cooper Clinic and that's the, the building you see in the, up, uh, the upward right corner of the slide. This was a small hospital uh, that served the community um, regardless of ability to pay. And this was my parents' dream was always to serve their community. Uh, they taught my brother and my sister and me, and that's us in the lower left-hand corner, about the importance of using the blessings and gifts that you have been given to improve the lives of others. So in addition to their work, my parents also were involved in, in civic uh, organizations and you know, worked on things like um, adult literacy campaigns, um, also different efforts to, to end um, diseases such as leprosy in Liberia. So I grew up with a strong sense of um, the importance of service and giving back to community. Uh, at the same time, while I'm growing up in Liberia, I was also very much aware of how fortunate my family and I were because of the opportunities we had had. My parents were both educated and I went to a private international school. And, you know, but while I lived in a, a pretty comfortable home overlooking the Atlantic Ocean, I saw many children in Liberia um, who looked a lot like the photo you see in the middle of the slide on, on the bottom, who were poor. Um, they lived in homes that had dirt floors. Uh, many of them didn't have running water in those homes. Uh, a lot of them didn't have enough food to eat every day. And so I was really aware of um, how fortunate I was and aware of how opportunities shape our lives and how they shape our health. And I didn't have the words for it at that time in my life, but what I, I knew was that on some level it seemed unfair. And so what I envisioned was a world where there was actually social justice, where there was fairness in the distribution of wealth and opportunities and privileges within a society. Um, and I always show this slide when I give my talks because I discovered a few years ago that um, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, when he was um, put in jail in 1963 for staging um, a demonstration against unfair um, laws, actually wrote a letter from the Birmingham jail um, where when he was released, but he wrote, wrote the letter um, saying that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And the reason why this became so important to me as I um, realized when this all happened was because I learned that the letter was actually written on April 12, 1963, which is a day that I was born. So um, I often wonder whether I actually came into this world with a passion for addressing injustice because I was born at such a time. And, um, and so I draw a lot of inspiration from Dr. Martin Luther King, um, as well as many others who have gone before me and uh, opened doors and opportunities um, for um, me. So what I began to learn, um, even though I didn't, again, have the words for it at that time, was that those children I saw in the streets in Liberia were the faces of health disparities, which are preventable differences in the burden of disease injury or violence or opportunities to achieve optimal health that are experienced by socially disadvantaged populations. These disparities or differences are really unfair because they are un, they're avoidable and they actually occur within countries and between countries. So we have countries that are high income countries like the United States and um, United Kingdom, for example, and, and countries like Liberia, where I was born, that are lower income countries where we see stark disparities in health and in opportunity between those countries, but also even within a high income country such as the United States, we see that there are people who, um, who benefit from a lot of opportunities where um, others don't. And what I really envisioned um, would be a country and or a world where there was actually an absence of these systematic disparities in health between more or less disadvantaged groups. 
Uh, this is a definition that the World Health Organization puts forward for health equity is that it's when every person has a fair opportunity to attain their full health potential and no one is disadvantaged from achieving this potential because of social position or other socially determined circumstances. So this became my purpose early in life. Um, I, I knew it in my heart, even though I didn't really um, have the words for it or even know exactly how I would do it, but I really felt that that was something um, important because I really felt like um, if I could have opportunities to have a good life, I wanted other children to, to have the same. Um, but on my 17th birthday, um, there was a coup in Liberia and the government was overthrown in a very violent and bloody um, military coup. And several of my family members actually were caught up in the violence and many of them were attacked, including my father, simply just because we were members of an advantaged group in a country that had a lot of disparities. And so um, I don't think I need to even tell you any more about how deeply personal this issue is and has continued to be throughout my life because I can I have seen firsthand how inequity within a society harm not only those that are most disadvantaged, but can actually end up harming everyone. So this happened on my 17th birthday, and fortunately, my immediate family members and I were safe, even though we lost many other family members, extended family members and friends. Uh, we were able to escape the violence, and um, we came to the United States where I continued my education. It was my senior year in high school. And so after I graduated from college at Emory University in Atlanta, um, I went to University of North Carolina for medical school. And then I, I moved to the Maryland area because um, at, by this time, a lot of my family members had settled in the Washington DC, Maryland area and, and began my residency at University of Maryland Hospital. And one of the things I realized was that actually here I was in Baltimore and it seemed to me that the people I saw around me actually were struggling with a lot of the same problems I saw in my uh, fellow countrymen in Liberia growing up. There were a lot of people living in poverty, a lot of people uh, struggling to find meaningful employment, dealing with crime in their neighborhoods, dealing with discrimination when they um, when they went out to, to seek you know, loans or when they, they went out to try to buy a car or buy a home, and even while getting health care. I really saw a lot of disparities in the treatment of uh, people who were predominantly African-American uh, from the inner city in Baltimore uh, compared to people who were more advantaged and who had traveled, for example, um, from other states or from other countries to obtain their care from us. So this was at the height of the opioid epidemic and the HIV epidemic. And um, you know, both of these epidemics disproportionately impacted communities of color. And it was around this time that actually I even saw a young woman who was an African-American woman um, who had come in with a fever and a headache and, um, and was HIV positive. And even though I was like extremely fatigued the night that I admitted her to the hospital and sort of was going through the motions of my, my admission, um, I connected with her because I saw um, a, a commonality uh, that I, I shared with her. I felt that she could have been one of my friends from Liberia. You know, she we were about the same age, and um, she was she's an African American woman, and she actually must have felt that same connection with me because she shared that um, that she had gotten HIV from her boyfriend, and um, and that you know. She had trusted him, but and didn't realize that he had somehow been involved with, with drug use and had contracted it from someone else. And so here she was, and in, in a healthcare system where many people might have made assumptions about her being promiscuous or using drugs herself, and none of those things were was even true about her. So it really made me realize that you know I could do everything I wanted to take care of each individual patient the best way possible. But if I really wanted to do something about these uh, disparities that I was seeing in treatment and in care, that I really needed to understand the problem on a broader scale. So I, after I left my residency at University of Maryland, I went to Johns Hopkins 
to do a fellowship in general internal medicine and also to obtain training in public health at the School of Public Health there. Um, thinking that what I would do is, is get that information, that knowledge, and then, and then go out and get involved in public health practice and maybe in, in advocacy. I had no idea that I would be bitten by the research bug. So, but when I got there, when I, when I arrived at Baltimore um, at the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health, one of the things I began to learn was about the importance of data. So here's a map of Baltimore, and you could actually replicate this map from many U.S. cities and many cities around the world, frankly, where you see that there are huge differences in the experiences and the lives and the opportunities between people who live in different neighborhoods. So this slide just compares two neighborhoods in Baltimore, one of them, Roland Park, where a lot of the faculty from Johns Hopkins live, and that neighborhood is predominantly white. Um, the average income is about $90,000 per year, very low levels of unemployment and homicide, and the life expectancy at birth is 83 years. But compare that to Madison East End, and this is a neighborhood very near to Johns Hopkins Hospital, where I actually see patients in the East Baltimore Medical Center. And that neighborhood is 91% African American. You can see the, the household income level is about a third of what it is in Roland Park. Unemployment rates are three times higher. Um, homicide rates are 10 times higher. And there's a 20-year gap in life expectancy between those two neighborhoods that are only five miles apart. And so this really is a stark reminder of how uh, where we live and our opportunities shape our health and our lives. And so I began to really realize the importance of having data and information on this problem to solve it. And I realized that a lot of people actually were not studying some of the problems that I saw in communities of color and more disadvantaged communities. Um, there was some research being done, but a lot not answering the types of questions that I thought needed to be answered. And so lo and behold, I ended up uh, deciding that I would pursue a career in, in research to, to better document these problems, um, the things that contribute to them, and hopefully to come up with solutions. So what have we learned? Actually, um, we have learned that health disparities are pervasive. There's been growing evidence base for this over many, many decades now. Um, health disparities across numerous conditions, all shown on this slide, populations, settings, um, that, um, that these disparities actually impact quality of life and, um, and costs and they impact our entire society. Um, and then we just have added to that list COVID-19. Um, in the past year, COVID-19 has probably been the major contributor to disparities in, in mortality. Uh, whereas before that, it was, it was cardiovascular disease and many of the other conditions you see on this slide. So, but if we want to address health disparities, we have to understand um, how they come about and so, and who they impact. And so this slide basically shows that health disparities result from multiple complex interactions um, across multiple factors. And they impact people um, predominantly from racial and ethnic minority groups in the United States. They also impact uh, people differentially across gender, uh, income levels, uh, people with low income levels tend to have worse uh, health, um, where you live again, um, and then across disability, physical or mental health disability. And so, you know, these factors, a lot of times when we are in clinical medicine or healthcare, we think a lot about biological factors such as our genetics and, um, you know, things that, that we sort of have inherited. Um, we think about risk behaviors, things like smoking and drinking and drug use, and we try to counsel people to change those behaviors and we try to give them medications and, and treatments that will address those biological factors. But a lot of times we don't acknowledge that, you know, the reality is that people, um, people's health is shaped by many more things, are by, by social conditions, by economic policies in our society by factors in their physical environment, things like whether or not they can get access to healthy food to eat, or whether they can uh, engage in physical activity in a safe way. Institutional factors, you know, things like policies around hiring and um, payment and the minimum wage, 
um, whether or not there are discriminatory um, practices or policies within institutions, factors going on within the healthcare system, uh, and then as well as social relationships, things like um, social connections, um, connections to people with power and influence, whether or not there's um, uh, discrimination and sort of conflict between people within a society, which really tends to be increased when there's inequities, um, as, as you heard from some of my own personal experiences growing up. So there are all these factors that interact with one another to contribute to health disparities. And if we want to address them, we sort of have to unpack all of these things and understand more about them and how they interact with one another. So that's one of the things that's made this field, it's been challenging to, to you know, to really, uh, to overcome health disparities. But on the other hand, um, it's one of the most sort of rewarding things and one of the things that really calls for um, engagement across multiple groups of people and people with different kinds of expertise. So the other thing we don't talk about, which is kind of the elephant in the room, is how do, do these social policies and economic policies and this our physical environment, how do how does how do they come to be this way? It, you know, it's not as if it's, and like one of my colleagues, Dave, Dr. David Williams says, it's not an act of God. It's actually um, a result of, you know, some pretty um, deliberate uh, decisions that we as a society have made. And so racism, we call this structural racism really is because our cultural attitudes towards people of different racial and ethnic groups have shaped the decisions that we've made about who gets access to these different opportunities and resources and who can live where. And that's what, you know, what has contributed to these disparities. So we have this overarching, you know, um, issue of these isms, racism being like the primary one, but we have sexism that impacts opportunities for people of different um, sexual uh, backgrounds and orientations. We have classism um, and we have ableism. So you know, these are the sort of the cultural beliefs and norms that we have in our society that drive our decisions about what policies we, we support and, um, and, and what opportunities we allow people from different groups to have. And so the most powerful groups get to make those decisions and then those who are less powerful have to often are the ones who are, um, you know, the ones that have to experience the negative effects of some of those things. So we really have to tackle this problem on multiple levels, but also acknowledge the fact that, you know, we as a collectively as a society have have sort of signed up for this and or um, agree to it. And until we all sort of acknowledge that the problems that have resulted as a result of this, um, we're going to continue to struggle with these issues. For me, I could have dealt with any number of these things, but for me, I wanted to focus on health system issues as a physician. And I also have also always been intrigued by relationships because I had lived in Africa as a child and had seen people from a lot of different cultural backgrounds and social backgrounds and noticed um, those sort of conflicts and interactions between different groups. And I'd also spent a couple of years in Europe in school and also knew not only what it was like to be from like a an advantaged group within a country like Liberia, but also to be sort of more disadvantaged because in Europe, I was in the minority. Um, I wasn't from Europe and I wasn't European and I was a person of color and a, a young woman who didn't actually speak the language fluently. I came to learn how to speak French after living in, in Switzerland for a few years. So I knew what it was like to be on that side of, on both sides of the equation. And then after coming to the United States, I also knew what it was like to be in the minority. I went to Emory in the South and so, you know, there were, um, I think the the distinctions and the interactions of, across people of different racial groups were pretty apparent uh, there in the South. So these are the things that really intrigued me. And so I wanted to really unpack some of the things that are going on within the healthcare system and in relationships. And primarily, um, I wanted to start with the doctor-patient relationship because I knew that that was one that was critically important because people really needed to interact with a doctor in order to get diagnosed and get recommended for different treatments. And so that, that you know, if you have disparities across so many different conditions and so many settings, 
you know, what's a common factor? And the one common factor is that you have to communicate with people and you have to relate with people. So um, I started out with a doctor-patient relationship. And so some of my early studies actually, um, we collected surveys uh, of patients of different racial and ethnic backgrounds. And we found that compared to whites, African-Americans and Hispanics experienced lower levels of trust in their physicians. They reported that they participated less in decisions about their care and their visits, that the doctors actually were more verbally dominant. Um, so they didn't actually report that part, but we actually obtained permission from both doctors and patients to record the visits. And we found that the doctors were actually dominating the conversations of um, patients of color more so than they were doing with, with white patients. That um, physicians sounded less positive, like less friendly when interacting with uh, minority patients. And there was less rapport building and conversation about what we call psychosocial issues, which would be things like think conversations about work or family. And it, the, the conversation was more narrowly focused on the medical issue. Um, the other thing I was interested in is whether it really mattered if people shared some, you know, background, whether it was race or, you know, um, social class or gender. So I really wanted to look at whether race concordance between doctors and patients made a difference. And what we did find is that when there was race concordance, that the visits were a little bit longer, about two and a half minutes, which doesn't sound that long, but believe it or not, that actually has been shown to make a difference into, as you know, the length of the visit does seem to influence whether or not people want to continue seeing a, that doctor. Um, we found that patients sounded happier and more relaxed when they were seeing a doctor of their same race, and that there was more participation in decision making and higher levels of satisfaction. So this wasn't that surprising, but you know it was concerning because we know that patients are not always going to have the opportunity to see a doctor of their same race or ethnic group. We also knew that most doctors don't go into medicine intending to treat people of different racial and ethnic groups differently. So we felt like there must be something else going on. And in fact, when we did surveys of doctors, we found that they actually endorsed um, what we call egalitarian attitudes towards people of different racial and ethnic groups, that they actually felt similarly positive as far as they knew uh, about people of different racial and ethnic groups. And they actually had gone to practice in these settings that were racially and ethnically diverse because they wanted to take care of those patients. So we thought something else must be going on. And, so we really got interested in the idea of implicit racial bias. Maybe there were some attitudes going on that people really weren't even aware of that could be driving their communication and their behaviors. So we did a study um, where we were enrolled primary care physicians in urban community practices, and we gave them the implicit association test. So many of you may have heard of these tests, the IATs, that were developed by researchers at, at, at Harvard. and. Um, these tests are computerized tests that ask people to do tasks where they match uh, the faces of people of different racial and ethnic groups with either positive or negative words. And so we gave the doctors the race IAT, and then we also gave them a race and medical compliance IAT. And so when they took those tests, we could determine whether or not um, they had an implicit bias favoring whites over blacks or an implicit stereotype that white patients might be more medically compliant than black patients. And it all has to do with sort of the speed of doing the task. So, you know, if you are really able to match good words and white faces very quickly and bad words with black faces very quickly, but when you are asked to do the reverse task where you have to match good words with black faces or bad words with white faces, you kind of make more mistakes on that then your test score actually shows that you have an implicit preference for whites over blacks. So we found that 70% of our physician sample, which was similar to the general population, had an implicit bias favoring whites over blacks and that implicit stereotype that whites are more medically adherent than blacks. And that when, when there was more implicit racial bias or stereotyping that that was actually linked to poor communication behaviors. So we audio recorded those visits again and then we found that when there, as doctors that had higher um, racial bias scores actually uh, communicated um, 
They were more verbally dominant. They spent more time talking about medical issues and not broadly about um, psychosocial issues. And their African-American patients rated them lower in terms of being respectful and trustworthy. So this was needless to say, not uh, what a lot of doctors wanted to hear. And um, I think it was quite a controversial finding. It actually took a long time for me to get this study published in a medical journal, and it ended up getting published in the American Journal of Public Health. But even more importantly, you know, for us was that, okay, now we've identified this problem now, you know, what can we do about it? So, you know, pretty soon after this, I began to transition my work into not just looking at what was contributing to disparities, but how could we come up with some solutions? So we did a trial called the Patient Physician Partnership to Improve High Blood Pressure Adherence. And this was a study where we randomly assigned doctors uh, to get computer-based communication skills training that really focused on the, the behaviors that we had identified to be problematic. We tried to get um, physicians to understand by giving them feedback on, you know, we, we would have them recorded with a mock patient and they would see how, how verbally dominant they were being with this African-American um, patient. And so we encouraged them to listen more and speak less and to balance the conversation more on the psychosocial and the and the, um, the medical issues to engage the patient more in um, decision making and, you know, basically just to, to do more uh, rapport building, show more empathy and concern. And so really having doctors to focus on these behaviors, even though we've all been trained to do these things in, in medical school, you know, uh, sometimes we don't realize that we're actually not doing those things until it's pointed out to us. So we randomly assigned the doctors to get training, either to get that training or to just get a, a brochure about hypertension treatment. And then we randomly assigned their patients, the patients of these doctors to be either coached by a community health worker. So a community health worker would actually help patients to become more prepared for their visits and to prompt them to ask questions and um, you know to state their opinions uh, and all of those things. And then, um, and then, so half of the patients got coached by a community health worker and the other half just got, again, a, a newsletter, a monthly newsletter. And what we found is that the patients who were coached and whose doctors had gotten the communication skills training showed much greater improvements in information exchange with their physician, participation in decisions about their care, and then improvements in their blood pressure because these were all people who had high blood pressure at the beginning of the, of the project. So this indeed was promising. Um, uh, we knew that there was uh, something that could be done if doctors could be um, sort of reminded and supported in, in engaging in the right behaviors, uh, despite what their implicit attitudes might be. We also know that having patients become more activated seemed to have an impact. And it actually seemed that the patient component was more, even more powerful than the, than the physician component, but that you actually needed both. So um, this was encouraging work, but again, it was a small study, only about 279 patients, mostly ethnic minorities and poor persons um, in, in Maryland, and a small group of physicians who had been willing to participate in this. So again, we, we knew that this would require work that would um, make these kinds of programs more widely available um, to both patients and physicians. So, you know, one of the things we learned from this is that, you know, we, not everyone's going to have the opportunity to participate in such a full-scale program, but we did try to develop some sort of take-home lessons um, that doctors could use. So we came up with a checklist uh, for implicit bias called RELATE, and it basically just emphasizes those behaviors we know to be important, uh, respecting the humanity of the patient in front of you, empathizing with them, putting yourself in their shoes, listen more, talk less, Ask yourself what assumptions you're making if you can slow the process down of, um, you know, our sort of automatic process would be to just not even realize that we've made an assumption and then begin to act. So begin to do that. Talk with patients about their personal lives and not just their medical problems and engage them in problem solving and decision making. So we know it's not that easy, but again, this is like a, a tool basically for physicians to use. And then similarly, we developed um, a tool for patients to use to become more empowered, to do their part. So um, really prepare for your doctor treatments, your doctor visits, 
act during your visit, review any key recommendations you get, and then take those recommendations home to create a to-do list. So do your part for the empowered patient. Um, you know, again, these tools are just things that can be used to support people in doing things. But again, we know that it's going to require much more investment on the part of health systems and communities to make these kinds of, um, make it possible for people to engage in these behaviors that we know uh, do lead to better health, and, uh, better care. So, you know, so fast forward, you know, I'd done this small study and, um, and it had shown some promising results. And again, it had been cited in some national reports and, and there were lots of calls for care to become more patient-centered, especially care um, that uh, to improve the care of, of socially disadvantaged groups. There were lots of calls for us to address more um, implicit bias and discrimination within healthcare uh, during that time. But then it became more apparent that, you know, we weren't going to be able to make changes um, that would be lasting if we only interacted with people or intervened on one level or even maybe on two levels. So you can see all these different factors, again, that contribute on multiple levels to inequities in, in health outcomes. So there's the individual patient. There's also their family and friends and their support network uh, that could, you know, could help to, to sort of bolster any sort of impact you might have on them as individuals. There are organizational and provider factors. And then there's a the broader sort of policy and community level factors. So our field began to evolve, to evolve whereby we began to learn that we needed interventions that targeted multiple levels. And so these are just examples of different intervention targets that it could occur at these multiple levels. And the fact is that, you know, when we're talking about healthcare, and this is just about healthcare. So this setting could be schools, it could be, um, it could be a workplace, it could be um, out in the community, it could be in within law enforcement, you know, this model could actually be used in any of those settings. But we're looking at healthcare now, we know that there are all these key interactions among different groups within those settings. So we really need to be um, looking at how these interventions impact these different interactions and decisions, and then how they impact upon key outcomes. So a lot of the studies had focused on clinical outcomes and on things like hospital admissions and, and costs and services. Uh, there have been many fewer studies that really focus a lot on patient experiences. So we really called for, you know, really looking carefully more at those factors as well, but really trying to look at this problem in a much more comprehensive way, doing these multi-level interventions. And so, you know, what became clear, this was around um, 2010 at this point, was that in order to do this, you really need to create teams of people that have expertise in all these different areas and that work in partnership with communities. So I was fortunate to get a grant from the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute to, to establish a center at Johns Hopkins, a center for population health and health disparities. And we focused on cardiovascular health disparities. Again, remember cardiovascular disease being uh, the major contributor to health, racial and eth ethnic health disparities in the United States you know, at that time. And so, and continues to be a leading contributor. So we did three intervention studies that targeted multiple levels um, over the first 10 years of the center. And we did this in partnership with numerous, um, we had clinicians, we had public health professionals, we had economists, we had um, historians, we had psychologists, um, you know, and then we also worked with communities to establish this center. So we began to move the field forward. <clears throat> you know, one of our studies, Redship, was focused on health system factors a lot and about how people work together in teams and how you train um, nurses and pharmacists and dietitians to work together with patients to help them be more um, uh, able to address their, their barriers in, in taking care of themselves with their hypertension. We did another study called Five Plus Nuts and Beans, which focused more on the dietary book component, um, coaching people on how to eat healthier and how to order their foods and worked in partnership with a grocery store and a library to, to, to improve access to online ordering and delivery of food to people who were living in a food desert who couldn't get fresh fruits and vegetables from the markets in their own neighborhood. 
Um, we also did another study act where we had uh, different uh, combinations of people working with community health workers, um, doing uh, group sessions where they focused on how to uh, self-manage and do problem solving around their hypertension, you know, or uh, sort of the one-on-one -on -one coaching uh, approach as well. And so we wanted to see which approach would work better. So we did learn some really uh, important lessons, um, some of them around the fact that, you know, um, you really have to engage with community in order to increase the reach of these interventions. There are a lot of people who are unable to uh, get into the healthcare system because of, you know, a lot of social challenges, things like transportation or um, not being able to take time off work, um, you know, um, other issues going on within their families um, that needed, you know, uh, attention. And so we, we learned a lot about that. We learned about some of the health system challenges with staffing and affordability. And um, so we really learned that, um, with, that we still have more work to do, but um, we were happy to be able to contribute to that. So, you know, one of the things we learned, of course, was that there was a gap in implementation. So we would learn, we would know that there are certain diets that work or medications that work to improve hypertension and diabetes, which is another condition that commonly occurs with hypertension. Um, and we knew a lot about the epidemiology, but because, you know, we might not have engaged all the right stakeholders in the process, or um, we hadn't talked with the, the people who actually pay for things, we were not really accomplishing what we, our goal was, which was equity, because we were, we didn't really understand what all the implementation challenges were. So, you know, Moving on, um, we began to really delve more deeply into understanding implementation challenges. So, and then the other thing we learned is we needed to broaden our focus beyond cardiovascular disease. So um, in 2015, we actually renamed the center and the center is now called the Center for Health Equity. Um, we just celebrated our 10th year um, in 2020. And our mission, again, is to advance scientific knowledge, but it's also to educate and train leaders. We really understood the critical importance of not just doing the work ourselves, but training future researchers and practitioners and community leaders. And to work, we continue to work in partnership with communities, but even more um, explicitly now, and even with, with, with a purpose, like really looking to make sure we have the right people uh, within communities, the people who are actually the key influencers or the ones who are uh, most impacted by the problem and have a say and to give them a say in what the solutions ought to be. And so um, I'm proud to say that uh, our center now has over 40 faculty, uh, also over 70 uh, community partners. We have had trained over 180 people locally, and we've also trained more than 4,000 people globally because we uh, made our courses available on an online platform. So again, our three-pronged approach is engagement, research, and training. So we have a community advisory board, we have health system partners, and then we have local, national, and global policymakers that we engage with to, to better understand these issues. Then we have our research projects, um, which I'll tell you more about our current research projects, and then we have our training. So I'm going to tell you more about our three current research projects. Um, the middle one, the five plus nuts and beans for kidneys, I won't spend as much time on, but it builds on our earlier work and now focuses on people with early kidney disease because we know that that group is at really high risk for progression of their kidney disease if their hypertension isn't managed well. And we know that they respond very well to dietary changes. And so now we're doing that same approach that I told you about before, but now we're chronic kidney disease patients. So let me tell you a little bit more about our community advisory board. Uh, we really work uh, in partnership with uh, partners locally in the Baltimore, Washington, mid-Atlantic region, but also globally, and I'll tell you more about that. But it, a lot of that has to do with the fact that I always had wanted to uh, have an impact on health inequities in West Africa. And so fortunately over the past several years, I've had the opportunity to reconnect with, with people with colleagues there and to begin to do some of the work there that uh, I'm doing here in the U.S. and to learn um, in both directions. So like I said, we have more than 60 um, partners, uh, 70 right now. 
we really use this as a way to learn bi-directionally. So they, our community partners tell us what's going on, what's most important to, to them um, and what kinds of intervention approaches they think would be most acceptable and most successful. We also teach them about what we've learned about the science. We try to build a capacity with them as well and to support them in their efforts. So it's just been so rewarding. And I think um, it's helped to make our work much more relevant. And then once we do uh, complete our projects, our partners are able to help us to disseminate the, the information about it um, more broadly to their um, stakeholders, to their communities and the people they serve. So here are some examples of our health system partners. A lot of them are federally qualified community health centers, as well as national um, and large um, health systems, um, such as our own at Johns Hopkins. And then we have community partners that are local as well as national uh, organizations, ranging all the way from academic institutions, um, uh, patient advocacy groups, to public health organizations, health professional organizations, to you know, um, biotech um, and pharma uh, groups that are interested in improving health of communities and advancing health equity. So our Rich Life Project is our current large project. Uh, is a cluster randomized trial being done in Maryland and Pennsylvania. We enrolled um, 1,822 patients with hypertension plus other conditions. And one of the reasons we did this is because we learned from our community partners that um, that a disease specific focus that we, you know, such as the ones we use often in medical research is not that relevant to a lot of people, that people live with more than one condition. And so they really wanna be looked at holistically. And so we broadened our focus. So even though we might be focusing on hypertension, we included people with other conditions and we try to address the concerns of these other conditions that are, are most common among people with hypertension. So we did this and we compared a, a program that focuses mainly on the health system, you know, so training clinic staff and system leaders around improving blood pressure management and health equity approaches. And we compared that to a program that also not only targets the health system, but also includes a nurse care manager, community health worker to work with individual patients to individualize their treatment, to go out to, to them in community to give them things they need and to refer them to resources in the community. And then we also set up a specialist core, which is kind of a consultation team that is virtual so that um, people could have the opportunity for their case to be discussed with among specialists because we learned that people from disadvantaged populations often lack access to specialists. So this study began um, in 2015 and is just wrapping up now and our outcomes are 12 and 24 month um, outcomes, uh, looking at blood pressure control, changes in systolic blood pressure. We're also gonna look at changes in the other health conditions for those people who have diabetes or depression or heart disease or smoking um, and high cholesterol. We're gonna also look at patient uh, uh, um, reported outcomes, like how activated patients are, um, how well they're able to self-manage and uh, their experiences of care. So stay tuned for our results. Um, again, like I mentioned, we had the opportunity to work with partners um, working globally as well. Um, one of the reasons this came about was because during the Ebola uh, epidemic, um, I actually was called on to work on some of the Ebola vaccine studies uh, because of my expertise in working with disadvantaged communities and also because I was from Liberia, one of the countries impacted by um, Ebola. And so, you know, through that experience, I made many connections back in West Africa and through some of my trainees here at Johns Hopkins, who are also from Ghana, um, Nigeria, I was able to reconnect with a number of partners. And so we've begun a program in the center that is a, a called a local to global and global to local initiative. And so one of our studies is this study called the Adinkra study, which is addressing hypertension care in Africa. And we're using some of the same strategies we use in Baltimore uh, and in Pennsylvania, but with um, adults in Ghana who are from socioeconomically disadvantaged uh, communities. And we're using mobile health technology. You know, imagine that we're using that in Ghana and we're learning about how well that works in Ghana and, and how it could work well in, in the US as well. 
So that's been a very you know, fruitful collaboration. And those are my colleagues, uh, Drs. Yvonne Commodore Menza, who is a Johns Hopkins um, a scholar in nursing, and Dr. Stephen Sarfo, who is a neurologist uh, in Kumasi, Ghana. And so here are some of our courses that we offer online. Uh, so now we have people uh, globally who are learning about um, foundations for health equity research and sort of more advanced um, practices and policy um, efforts. And so um, through this work, we've learned a lot. And um, I have collaborated with, with people who are sociologists as well as public health professionals to, to learn about how we address health equity on a broader scale beyond the healthcare system. So the key lessons learned my colleague, Dr. David Williams and I described in a review article um, in 2019, this was actually before COVID-19 hit, but we learned that we, we said we actually have a lot of information already to take action. And one of them is to create communities of opportunity. And we talked a lot about addressing issues like early childhood education, like employment opportunities, you know, like increasing um, um, safe housing and neighborhood conditions. We know that a lot of those intervention approaches are effective, but we're not implementing them. So we really need to, to use that science to um, you know, engage with policymakers to really support um, these policies that will create communities of opportunity. We talked a lot about what we know about building more health into the delivery of healthcare. So improving and expanding access. And fortunately, we've seen a lot of that happen with um, the Affordable Care Act and with some of the new leg legislation in the American uh, Rescue Plan. Um, we talked about the importance of strengthening primary care, addressing inequities in care, and diversifying the work healthcare workforce. Um, and then we talked about, you know, just increasing awareness on a broader societal level of inequities and building political will. And I think despite the challenges we're facing at this time, fortunately, I think uh, there's been some national awakening to inequities in our society. And hopefully that is going to sort of push people to um, engage with, with policymakers and support policies that will be more um, supportive of, of equity. So the other key lesson we learned is that equity is not equality. Um, a lot of people have said for a long time, they thought if we just gave everybody the same thing, that would be great. Um, and, and in theory, that sounds good. But as you look at this, um, this infographic from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, you can see that equality is like giving everybody the same bike when people need different things. Different groups of people need different resources. And that's what we have to focus on for health equity. It's not a matter of doing a one size fits all. So let's fast forward to the COVID-19 pandemic and, um, and then we can sort of wrap up from there. Unfortunately, COVID-19 has shown a bright spotlight on inequities. Um, this slide from the CDC shows that the, the cases, the hospitalizations and death rates from COVID-19 have been in many cases, anywhere from two to almost fourfold higher in communities of color in particular. Um, and a lot of that is due to those factors that we talked about, uh, those opportunities for uh, safe housing, for access to healthy food, for the ability to work from home, for example, um, and to not live in crowded conditions, um, to have access to care. So all of these factors have contributed um, to the disparities we've seen in COVID-19. Um, working with another colleague of mine, Dr. Josh Sharfstein, we actually wrote an op-ed in Politico, which is targeted at policymakers, calling for a game plan to help the most vulnerable. And this was early in the pandemic where we called for tracking data uh, on COVID-19 by race, ethnicity, and geography to really you know, go to where the hotspots are to try to uh, put in things like uh, testing and uh, uh, treatment. We talked about the importance of building and building trust and communicating with communities of color. So those partnerships that um, are so critical to our success uh, within our center. We talked about enhancing access to testing and healthcare, protecting essential and low wage workers, many of whom are people of color and people with low income, and then providing those social services that are critical during this pandemic. And so fortunately, some of our advocacy efforts have been successful and we've seen a lot of support um, through the, the policies and the funding that's come about um, during this time. But we hope that it will continue beyond just the next two years and that it will gain bipartisan support because 
Um, these problems are not going to go away in a short time. You know, if we look at the vaccination rates, we can see that, you know, we're still seeing disparities in vaccination rates for Blacks and Latinos compared to whites and Asians. Fortunately, we've seen that um, the indigenous population uh, of Native Americans and American Indians are actually being vaccinated at rates similar to the rates of whites. And why is that? That's because there's been strong engagement of tribal leaders and there's been there's very strong trust in the Indian Health Service in those communities. And as a result, the acceptance of the vaccine has been very high in those communities. So that's a really important lesson for us. Um, you know, at the same time, we have to be mindful that there are global inequities in, in COVID-19 vaccination. While the United States is doing pretty well right now, we're at over 20% of our population having been inoculated. We can see that you know many other countries throughout the world still don't have vaccines for their populations, and you know as we've seen, we are our futures are inextricably linked. You know we have a global economy at this point in time, and everything that impacts one country impacts another. Um, we travel a lot. Um, if if we don't make sure that everyone gets vaccinated. We're not all going to be safe until everyone's safe. So uh, higher income countries um, have contributed to the, the COVAX initiative, but they there's much more in that needs to be done in that regard. So we have to take care of ourselves, but we also have to remember to take care of the, the most vulnerable. And so um, this is another a message that uh, my colleague, Dr. David Williams and I have written recently where we called for a new kind of herd immunity. So. We've said that it's really important to flatten the curve um, of COVID-19 by addressing very systematically and comprehensively in inequities. Um, and because that we're all interconnected, the failure to protect the most people at risk not only harms them, but also increases the spread of infection and harms all of us. And so we're saying that really resistance to the spread of poor health will only occur if we have a sufficiently high proportion of all people that are protected from and immune to negative social factors. So it's not just the biological factors such as the COVID-19 um, infection, the SARS-CoV virus, which we know biological immunity is very important, but it's also those other social factors that are inequitably distributed across our groups that could really continue to harm us all. So that's the message of uh, why are health disparities everyone's problem. Uh, that's the title of my book that's coming out in June. Uh, I hope you all will um, will look forward to, to getting a copy of it. And I look forward to talking with you in the Q&A section. And um, you know, I'll just close by saying that our, our vision is health equity. And uh, I hope we can embrace that vision. And with um, an African proverb that I think really encapsulates this message so well that says, if you want to go fast, go alone, but if you want to go far, go together. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for that wonderful, wonderful lecture, um, Dr. Cooper. We, there are lots of comments and questions pouring in the chat, and it will be my privilege to alternate along with uh, Dr. Chiquita Collins in presenting those questions to you. Um, if I could, I would love to capture one idea that I haven't seen in the chat, but it really, um, there were two different slides where this was brought home to me. One is that you, you highlighted the difference in homicide rates in the, in the two areas of Baltimore that you were comparing, and those were staggeringly different um, a factor of 10. And as I think about all of the various interventions and approaches, I'm asking myself, how do those come together to actually help focus on this horrifying disparity in homicide? And at the same time, I noticed that you had worked the word peace into the renaming of your center. And I thought those two things might be related. And I wondered if I could give you this opportunity to share some thoughts um, yeah. along those lines. Certainly, no, I'm happy to do that. Um, actually, I, I didn't really work the word peace into the renaming of my center, but that was a, a message that was sent out at the beginning of 2020, sort of sending out um, wishes for peace and 
and health and joy uh, to all of our partners in, in 2020. And that was, it was just kind of, it's kind of a foreshadowing, uh, it seemed like of what was to come later that year. But um, what I will say is that, you know, clearly the differential in homicide rates, um, we, you know, those of us who work in this field clearly believe that it is related to these uh, structural inequities and racism, you know, that, that sort of, that impacts our communities, you know. So if people have limited opportunities from the time they're, they're children to obtain a, a, a strong education and to get uh, gainful employment and to have any sort of reasonable chance of having a productive and fulfilling life, it sort of does um, kind of point people towards lives of, of desperation and, and violence uh, towards one another and, um, and, and, and perpetuates these, you know, these sorts of um, conflicts that we see among people in society. And if people have a sense of hopelessness about their future because they feel there's no way they can be successful or, they, or that they might even die at the hands of, of uh, law enforcement, you know, whether or not they were doing something wrong or not, then, you know, what do they have to lose? And so I think we contribute to, to as a society, we kind of have, by our decisions that we've made regarding how we distribute our opportunities and resources to different communities, we've actually contributed to this problem. We, we all have been played a part in it. And so we have a collective responsibility to correct it. Thank you. I'm sure we could talk and talk about that one. Um, Dr. Collins, I'm going to pass the microphone to you. Well, we have some wonderful questions and trying to choose which one to ask you, Dr. Keeper. And so you, you spoke on your research on uh, provider patient racial congruency. And so one of our attendees asked the question, given that there has not been much change in terms of the number of Black physicians um, in our country today. In fact, studies have shown that, especially in terms of Black men, that the rate is similar to what the rate was in 1978. Mm -hmm. And so what would be your, your advice, your recommendation? You know, this is true and dear to my heart with many uh, chief diversity officers across academic health centers across the country. This is a challenge that we face. And so how, what would you say, what would you recommend in terms of increasing that number? Well, yeah, I mean, I wish that was a quick answer, but I think that there are a number of different places to start. I mean, I think certainly there are programs that need to start very early um, in the educational process so that we know that young people of color have opportunities to be educated in such a way that they'll be well prepared for careers in science and technology and engineering and medicine, so in STEM careers. So I think some of those early childhood um, opportunities that I mentioned when I talked about creating communities of color that Dr. Williams and I talked about, that's where some of those programs fit in. Um, you know, so I think it, we really need to create these pipeline programs. Of course, that's not gonna fix the problem right away. You know, so I think in terms of what we can do right away is that when we do have people of color admitted into our schools, we need to, make sure that the environment is welcoming to them and that they are able to succeed. And so they shouldn't experience discrimination and, and, and be harassed by patients or by colleagues or by superiors. And we know that that's a problem. So I think we have a situation that we can really work on. Our institutional leaders can create um, a climate that is respectful and inclusive of people, regardless of you know, their background. And, um, and really model those behaviors so that, um, that, so that others know how to behave accordingly. And that's how we're gonna be able to attract people to come into our field. You know, so doing that, making sure that people have uh, uh, excellent mentorship when they do come in uh, through um, our programs and that we have people of color who they can see as role models in holding leadership roles and you know those sorts of things. So that's what we can do kind of in the immediate um, period. But then of course there's got to be a much longer term solution that really address, addresses the kind of the core and root uh, structural issues that have led to the, these inequities. Thank you. And of course I wanna hats off to, to Dr. Collins for the 
impact that you are having here in, in the short time you've been at our institution with programs like the microaggression training that all of us are taking. Um, I really do think that um, your presence here is making a difference and, and uh, we're very grateful. Um, I, Sorry, like you know, I wanted to just add to that. It's not only about the interpersonal treatment and the climate, but it's also about the structural issues. So some of the policies we have that kind of systematically end up excluding people of color. Like if we are just used to only interviewing people from certain institutions and we don't consider other factors more broadly, we could be, um, you know, systematically biased in kind of our, um, our application and our review process of, of our applicants. So it's things like that too, those kinds of policies that need to be carefully reviewed to make sure that there's not unintentional bias that's um, affecting that. Back to you, Dr. Bergeron, you're muted. Thank you. Um, I'd like to go to a question from C. Jane Lin, who says, I am a medical laboratory scientist here at UT. I was wondering how we could also contribute to correcting inequalities within the healthcare system. So a question from a laboratory scientist. Well, you know, so I think even as a laboratory scientist, I think the kinds of research questions you examine um, that you, if you really want to, you know, contribute to, uh, to enhancing health equity, you ought to be thinking about uh, whether you're answering questions that are relevant to those communities or whether or not you have included people from those communities in the, in the perspectives that you have in your work. So um, which problems are you studying? And who from those affected communities is involved in um, basically telling you whether they think that's an important problem to be addressed or not, and whether or not you are actually going about it, considering everything about that problem. So it's not as easy to see as maybe community oriented or population oriented research, but I still think that, you know, no matter what it is you're studying, for example, if you're studying, you know, uh, a disease that affects people of color or some problem that affects communities of color disproportionately, you ought to be making sure that those perspectives are included in your work, you know, and that you have scientists uh, who represent those communities on your team and working with you and that you're contributing to the training and mentorship of those individuals. So I think there are lots of different things that you can do. Thank you. So I have a timely question from Dr. Uh, Kinawala. Um, this is uh, in relationship to uh, vaccination hesitancy. What have you found is the single most important thing to gain trust with patients who are persons of color? Wow, single most important thing. Um, I think I would say basically unconditional positive regard which is basically just respecting the humanity of that person, um, respecting that they, although they may be different from who you are, or they might've had a different life experience and may have a different opinion about certain treatments or tests or things like that, that you honor and respect them as a human being. And that regardless of what decision they make, um, that you will still respect them and treat them with, empathy and with compassion. And so, um, you know, it's not about trying to get people to do what we want them to do, but it's about giving them the, the, the information they need to make an, an informed decision and a decision that is in their own best interest. So that's what I would say is respect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, we had a wonderful presentation uh, at our center not long ago by Dr. Lisa Fitzpatrick, um, who lives near you and you probably know Dr. Fitzpatrick, mm -hmm. but she made the point of um, start by just being on time. <laughs> <laughs> Be on time, how's that doctor? Be on time. Um, but the same concept was the unconditional positive regard. Um, well, I am kind of keen to get back to the community health worker question but before, that's where I wanna go, but I wanna highlight this question from Dr. Lisa Ochoa, who by the way, is a vascular surgeon um, who has deliberately 
set up her clinics in those neighborhoods where we had the highest rates of diabetes and amputation uh, related to compli com complications of diabetes. Dr. Ochoa is asking us, how do we translate this academic research and studies into real community outreach? Uh, community health workers are definitely a key component. Thank you, Lisa <laughs> Ochoa. Um, but I do believe we need to engage the community physician. How do you connect with community physicians to implement these initiatives? Well, you know, again, it's like always trying to figure out who is most involved in this problem and who is in a position to really uh, be impacted by whatever it is we're doing. So I've actually just actively invited community physicians from the, the neighborhoods that I'm working in to be a part of the conversation. Many of them are on my community advisory board. Um, in many cases, they have wanted to be involved in the research as well. Um, and they've so they've been included as investigators, co-investigators, and they've helped us to reach the patients that we want to reach. Um, we try to make sure that it's we are respectful of their time and um, that we include um, resources that they need to help them be successful in, in a, you know, completing the interventions. And they actually, by doing that, they actually help us design interventions, programs that are most likely to be usable and acceptable, you know, and so to be sustained after the study's over because we could come up with some fancy thing or some, something that we read about and that seems like wonderful, but if it's not something that can practically be done or sustained after the project funding is over, then, then what's the point? So I've actually just made, it's a lot of time and effort, but I can just say to anybody who's watching this or any others who have done such work, if you have done that work, you know that it's, it's the most rewarding aspect of it because most of us that are doing work in this area are not just doing this for the sake of like, doing it so, or just because, you know, we're academics, we really do want to, to improve people's lives and we do want to make real changes, not just, you know, something that's like a temporary thing that we, that we put on our, our CV. So it's, it's work, but it's rewarding and meaningful. And it's the thing that brings about lasting change. Thank you. So I think many of us on tonight's presentation will probably agree with the statement that you provided some real solutions in terms of call to action. And as many of us are aware that the CDC just recently uh, identified, or um, I would say uh, stated that racism is problematic. And so to see it elevated at that level, because many of us have been doing this work for many, many years. In fact, it's been documented over 50 years we've been uh, documenting health disparities, uh, but we've never seen where uh, an agency, a federal agency, really take the lead in this fairly recently because we're at a turning point in our country in terms of racial re reckoning. So what, where do you see us in terms of uh, are the next generation hoping that uh, these dis uh, disparities are actually uh, mitigated? Well, you know, I, I'm really encouraged by the level of awareness that I see in our young people. Um, and there's a degree of solidarity that I've seen among people that I haven't seen for a very long time. Maybe it was here when I was a baby or during the civil rights movement or something. But I feel like um, that I've seen a lot more of that despite the challenges we've been through. So I'm optimistic. Um, I think there are a lot of people that are very passionate about this. I think really what a lot of people need to understand is how interconnected so many things are. And a lot of times people think they're doing something that will help to benefit um, equity, but they don't realize that there's something else that they've been supporting or some sort of policy that they've benefited from, but that has harmed other people and that they just didn't even connect the dots on. So I think one of the things that we're seeing now is how connected everything is, like how the decisions about like our, our taxes or like, you know, where we live and, uh, you know, what programs should be funded or not funded, how all those things kind of do impact 
inequities and how that sort of harms not only the people who are in those groups, but harms like everybody, harms our whole economy. For example, if, you know, people can't get jobs that pay, like pay adequately, what that means for crime, you know, what that means for violence, what it means for costs to our healthcare system, you know. So I think more people can see how interconnected all these things are and see that really it's, it's about all of us. It's not about only one group of people. Um, and then also identify with other people because truly it's a matter of fate and luck in many ways that some of us end up in one, one place or, or another or in one group versus another, you know? So I think more, the more people can see that and see kind of our common humanity, I, I feel optimistic, but I think I have to be because of the work I do. Um, but again, I don't think it's based, uh, I don't think it's unrealistic. I really do see a, a, a difference in the young people and in their attitudes and an openness towards um, different people and how, how it's our strength, really. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd like to turn to a question from Ms. Melanie Stone, who's a member of our Center for Medical Humanities and Ethics um, and who directs our community service learning program, which is a key way that we provide experiential learning opportunities for our trainees um, to really connect to what is happening in the community and outside of our ivory tower. And Melanie uh, would ask your advice, Dr. Cooper, on empowering communities through increasing their health literacy as a way to promote equity. And P.S. I know she just helped write a grant about this issue, but she's now that now that that's done, she wants to hear what you recommend. Yeah. No, I mean, I think that's that's critically important. I think, you know, we all know that knowledge and education is power, you know, and there's a West African proverb that says when you educate um, a woman, you educate a nation. And that's because, you know, women um, tend to like, you know, also pass on their wisdom and their knowledge to their children. So I think that giving people information and giving them skills so that they can actually advocate for themselves is the best thing that we can do. I mean, I, I, because I don't think that having this sort of attitude that we know better and that we can make decisions for other people has never really gotten us very far at all. And, and so many people who are sort of against these programs that are, you know, what they, they think they consider them to be like charity programs. Nobody really wants charity. People all, people for the most part want to be able to, um, to help themselves, you know? So basically we're not, what, what empowering people is not about, uh, is not about handouts. It's about, you know, basically opening up opportunities that everyone, that other people have in a society. So why should some people have opportunities and others not? opening up the opportunity so that then people can create their own future and their own vision and they can advocate for themselves. So I'm all for it. And I think that's, you know, one of the greatest things we can do is to actually help people to have hope and to sort of see their own strengths and build upon their strengths. Because it's not as if we, you know, other people have the answers, you know, the answers are within those communities and within those those individuals. Yep, you're muted. I think we have time for one last brief question and I'd like to give the honor of asking that question to Dr. Collins. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Dr. Bergren. So you provided some tools of the trade in terms of uh, physicians being able to address these concerns that have been discussed tonight. What would you say in the context of medical um, uh, education curriculum? across the spectrum to really train our next generation of physicians? Um, should we start at the medical school, medical school level and our trainees and residents and fellows and um, our faculty? How do, how do we implement in terms of changing the course of how we uh, change behavior? Right. Well, okay, it's not going to be easy, clearly, but I mean, I think that one of the things we can do is to try to make sure that everybody like uses an equity lens onto everything that they're doing. So 
you know, when we think about the things we're learning, we ought to be thinking about how each of these problems or situations we're studying about might impact people differentially based on opportunities, based on where they live. And I, I always talk about the fact that I think we need to think about two broad categories of addressing inequities. One of them is more of the structural approach. So basically understanding how our society is organized and arranged such that people's opportunities are shaped, right? And trying to address those structural issues, which might have to do more with policies and practices within organizations and, and things like that, you know, staffing and those kinds of things. But then there's also not just the structural piece, but the relational piece. So then how do we kind of strengthen relationships between people? How do we um, make sure that people who work together work well together across whatever differences they have? How do physicians learn to care for people who are different from them? Because our population is becoming increasingly diverse. Our population is aging. We, we're gonna have people that have a variety of different challenges. And so physicians of the future are going to need to be able to address those, those issues. So they're gonna to need to be educated on the structural factors and not only thinking within the narrow medical realm, and they're gonna to need to understand, to have the skill sets to interact with people across multiple like, you know, factors, you know, whether it be something that's a, a visual characteristic like age or gender or race, or whether it's about sort of attitudinal factors that might be different. So I think we, we need to think of, of our education in those two broad categories, sort of structural competency and relational competency. Sounds great, thank you. <laughs> well, we're just about at the end of our time here. And I think it's wonderful to make a full circle and come back and reflect on the opening quote that you shared with us uh, from the letter from the Birmingham jail from Dr. Martin Luther King, that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. April 12th, 1963, and we'll never now forget your birthday, um, nor will we forget that you agreed to spend your part of your birthday month um, in our company. And we do wish that it had been here in San Antonio. Um, and I wanted to also remind everyone to take a look at that uh, note in the chat at 8.20 p.m. where Alex Bella is telling us how to um, access the URL and the Amazon code for uh, Dr. Cooper's book. And I have already asked Dr. Cooper if she will remember to put San Antonio on her itinerary when she launches her book tour. And I'm saying this with great optimism that we will in fact be able to welcome her here in person because of all the vaccine uptake that will be successful um, so that we will have a safe and healthy community uh, to welcome Dr. Cooper when she comes to visit. And with that, um, it is time for us to close. And uh, we offer our heartfelt thanks to you for spending this time with us and also for the considerable work that you do every day to make the world a better place. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Cooper. <laughs>